Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the Calamus section. We are in the final poem of the Calamus section, poem number 39, full of life now. Now we'll just pause for a moment and appreciate the fact of where we have been and where we are. My assumption is that you've been following our stuff. I hope that you have your own copy of Leaves of Grass and you've been annotating as we go. We started, of course, with those opening, very opening lines and then the inscription poems at learnstrong.net down the left-hand side, Talks with Walt. And there, well, we had 24 poems of inscriptions. We had 19 sections of starting from Pomenon. We had 52 sections of Song of Myself. We had 16 sections and poems of Children of Adam. And now we have the 39 poems of Calamus, which brings us to a grand total of 150 poems that you've now worked through together with us, all working to try to understand ourselves and Walt Whitman. I just want to pause for a moment, and I'll say more about this at the conclusion of this lecture, to say congratulations. You've done something quite remarkable if you've made it to full of life now. Now, the biography information and the background information that's provided for us um, from Norton's runs something like this. Um, this Calamus number 45 poem actually contains, in its original form, the rejected opening line, quote, Throwing far, throwing over the head of death, I, full of affection, end quote. And its second line, now the first and second lines, reads, 38 years old, the 81st year of the states, indicating that Whitman composed the poem in 1857. It took its present title in 1867. It was slightly revised then and also in 1871. Full of life now. Now, it's, of course, a lot of fun to kind of take a look at the last of any of these sections. What's the last poem of inscriptions? What's the last section of starting from Palm Arc 19? What's the last poem of Song of Myself 52? And of course, Children of Adam, we played the same game. Here we are, last poem of the Calamus section, full of life now. Full of life now, compact, visible, I, 40 years old, the 83rd year of the states, to one a century hence, or any number of centuries hence, to you yet unborn, these seeking you. When you read these, I that was visible am become invisible. Now it is you, compact, visible, realizing my poems, seeking me, fancying how happy you were if I could be with you and become your comrade, be it as if I were with you. Be not too certain I'm not now with you. It's a brilliant final poem for the Calamus section. Of course, the word life is one of the most popular words in all of Leaves of Grass. It's at the heart of Whitman's optimism as we've spoken about it so many times. A man of so much pain and sorrow, suffering, is still a man full of life now. Of course, this word now will begin the poem, will end the poem. Notice the brilliance of the construction. And as we've said, the immediacy of Whitman's poetry has had an indelible effect. I think it had an effect on T.S. Eliot and all of the great poets of the 20th and now the 21st century. That notion of being right there in the moment, full of life now. Now, he'll use this word compact. It's an interesting word. That is to say, tightly together. You could talk about compact language. Obviously, there's a whole lot of editing that went on through the course of the study. This notion of visible, we'll come back to it in a little bit, it's an interesting question. What does he mean when he uses this word visible along with this word compact? I want to argue that he's borrowing from the current science of his day, that he's playing around with some of the atomic kind of ideas in the early science 
of his, his own day. And this notion of visible obviously plays the game as well with the Platonic forms and, of course, Republic Book 7 and the cave allegory and all of that. Then he's going to take us back to the very opening lines of Song of Myself. Now, you'll remember in the opening lines of Song of Myself that he will label himself as a certain age, right? Let's go back and just look at those lines for just a second. Song of Myself, passage number one. Of course, you have your, I hope, annotated version of this to go back to it. I celebrate myself and sing myself and what I assume you shall assume for every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Again, the use of the word atom there, I think, takes us to the very notion of compact visible there. I loaf and invite my soul. I lean and loaf at my ease, absorbing a spear of summer grass. My tongue, every atom of my blood, formed from this soil, this air, born here of parents, born here from parents the same and their parents the same. I, now, notice, 37 years old, in perfect health began, hoping not to cease, to, hoping to cease not till death. Now, notice here, it's I, 40 years old, the, 30, the 83rd year of the States. So we're talking 1857, okay? I love how he puts in the same line his own age and the age of the States. There's such a, there's such a connection here. Um, and I think, of course, the Gettysburg Address will play the same game as does Martin Luther King's uh, uh, Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. That notion of measuring everything from Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence because it is such a precious document for Whitman and, of course, for all Americans. And then he'll say it to one, a century hence. Now this to blank, to a Western boy, to, to you. We've seen this construction over and over again in, in Lee's Address. To one a century hence, that would be of course 1957, or any number of centuries hence, how about 2057 and beyond, right? To you yet unborn. Notice the repeating, by the way, in this poem of you, 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 over and over again. We're going to see it a number of times, right? To you yet unborn, these seeking you. Now, you'll remember that at the conclusion of Song of Myself, he said, if you want to find me, look for me under your boot soles, right? I'm in the ground there. Here, notice he'll make the argument, I've been searching for you. And it's fascinating, the number of you that are reporting, that as you're reading through these poems, you're beginning to get a sense that you're not just searching for Whitman, he's searching for you. That's exactly what he said, which is, again, why we call these conversations talks with Walt, a, a seeking. Everything is about searching and seeking, of course, in, in Leaves of Grass, as we've said so many times. When you read, notice the break in the stanza, and then, when you read these, I that was visible am become invisible. It's a, it's a remarkable thing to think about engaging a text. I mean, we played that game when we did Keats's uh, upon first looking into Chapman's Homer, then felt I like some watcher of the stars when a new planet swims into his skin. That idea of what does it mean to engage a text? Or, for example, when we talked in Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, why does the young man go home sadder and wiser and not go off to party? Why is that? That identification with the text. Notice here, he says, when you read these, by the way, these, obviously, the songs, the carols, calamus sections specifically, right? These, I that was visible and become invisible. And, of course, that's the game that Whitman's been playing the whole time with you as a reader. Now, again, back to that use of the word now for immediacy. Now it is you. And then he'll use the same phrase, compact, visible, realizing my poems. Are you ready for this? The word realizing gets used one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here. Realizing my poems. Seeking me. So notice, we've got the symbiotic dance that's at play. He's seeking you, you're seeking him. Seeking me. Of course, this is what we're doing in Talks with Walt. This is what all biographers have tried to do in their study of Whitman and Leaves of Grass as well. Who is this guy, right? And then, again, only use in all of Lisa Grass, the word, fancying how happy you were. Now, of course, this use of the word happy, we've seen it a number of times in Lisa Grass, and it always makes us smile when he uses it, right? How happy you were if I could be with you and become your comrade. Now, this is, of course, the invitation. You've made it at this point through what I will con constitute as one-fourth of Leaves of Grass, 150 of the opening poems. You made it this far, you've become his comrade. You take him with you, not only by carrying Leaves of Grass with you, however you do that, but by having certain ideas of Leaves of Grass carried within you. 
And if there's any part of our study to this point that's made you happy, I think Whitman's smiling from somewhere visible or invisible, and to say, I told you so, be it, it's a strange syntax, right? Be it as if I were with you. Right? That is to say, if we have done our job well, then we are with Whitman as we are playing the game of these poems. That is an amazing idea. Very few writers before Whitman had ever tried to play with that level of immediacy. Of course, we think of the great ones. We think of Chaucer. We think of Shakespeare. We obviously think of Dante and Milton as playing a very similar kind of game of wanting to be right there, right? But then the parenthetics, which I think he learned, Whitman learned, this aside kind of game from Shakespeare. Be not too certain. Notice we go back to the idea of, uh, uh, of uh, realizing, right? Be not too certain, but I am now, back to the opening line with the word now, with you. Now, it's a compelling idea. And at 2A, of course, we could argue that the true artist never dies. The true artist lives on through the artistic construction and production, right? At 2B, I love the key words. I love the use of the word now. I love the way that the, he finishes the calamus section with such intimacy. No, no. I'm right there. I'm, I'm with you right now. We're going to see this again and again when we get to Brooklyn Ferry. We're going to hear this again, this intimacy he's able to construct. Well, at 3A, I've already mentioned how Lincoln and Martin Luther King both looked back to 1776, as obviously he does here. I like to think of Thoreau's Walden as trying to uh, uh, somehow find that level of intimacy. But, of course, the poet that maybe we love just as much, maybe even more than Whitman in 303, Emily Dickinson, of course, she'll play the same game. This is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. Judge tenderly of me, she'll say at the end of that one. I, you get a sense there's the same, there's the same kind of graceful spirit here, right? Finally, let's finish now in 3B. We're finishing the columnist section. We obviously have made it this far. How about this question or two? What, what can you track your evolution of your columnist appreciation? What was your favorite poem in your study of Calamus? And now, congratulations. If you look now at your table of contents of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass, you can qualify the first 150 poems as what we will think of as the first quarter, the first fourth of Leaves of Grass now over. We then will turn, just to give you a lay of the land, we then will turn and we'll go to a series in the second fourth, we'll go to a series of songs that we're going to see. Of course, we're going to celebrate Song of the Open Road as maybe being one of the great ones. Many argue it's the most important poem of Leaves of Grass. To room 303, we'll have reasons to talk about it, along with the Birds of Passage section, a Broadway pageant, and then Sea Drift. We're going to love Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking, and as I ebbed with the Ocean of Light, some argue that's the greatest poems in all of Lisa Grass. And then By the Roadside, a series of poems, short poems, that will remind us in some ways of the poems of Children of Adam and and, uh, and, and Calamus section. When I heard the learned astronomer we're going to have fun with, O Me, O Life, one of the greatest poems in all of Leaves of Grass. And that will bring us to the halfway mark in my, in my way of thinking of Leaves of Grass. Because when you get to the drum tap section, you're ready for the third quarter of the text. These poems will break your heart. They will also mend your heart. They are, of course, the poems that will most graphically describe Whitman's time in the American civil contest that, that we'll think of in regards to Lincoln and Gettysburg Address. And speaking of Lincoln, we'll also recognize the memories of President Lincoln and when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed. Many argue the greatest single construction ever for an American poet in that, in that one. Of course, oh, Captain, my Captain, the most famous of all of the poems of Leaves of Grass, and yet Whitman had problems with the poem, and we'll debate and talk about why. The final, then, conclusion of the poem, of, of Leaves of Grass, will then be by Blue Ontario Shore, and then reversals, and then a long series of, uh, of these goodbye poems that will take us through Autumn Rivlets, to Proud Music of the Storm, and then Passage to India. we got to circle that one as one of the great, great poems. And then, of course, The Sleepers as well, one of the amazing poems. Whispers of Heavenly Death, and then finally, From Noon to Starry Night, Songs of Parting, and then Sands at Seventy, and then finally, of course, Goodbye My Fancy, and the very final poem of Leaves of Grass, Goodbye My Fancy. 
Well, I invite you to continue your journey with us. I hope that you're seeking Whitman as clearly Whitman is seeking you. Thank you.